Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Radiation levels remain normal at Europe's largest nuclear power plant after Russian forces seized it. Ukraine and NATO accuse Russia of shelling the plant, but Russia denies it. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Brussels today meeting with NATO and EU leaders. What did they commit to and how long do they think the war in Ukraine will last? The Supreme Court reinstates the death sentence of the Boston Marathon bomber for his role in the 2013 explosions that killed three people and injured 265 others. Florida's abortion ban might expand this year. The bill has passed the Senate. Now it's on its way to the governor's desk where it's expected to be signed into law. And as COVID-19 cases decline, New York City announces its next step to normalcy, lifting mask and vaccine mandates. Russian forces are in control of Europe's largest nuclear power plant after shelling it in the middle of the night. The UN Atomic Energy Agency says the reactors are not hit and the plant is still operating with no change in radiation levels. Here's the latest information. A projectile hit a training center at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine and started a fire. It happened when Russian and Ukrainian forces fought over the energy hub early on Friday. The nuclear plant is the largest in Europe and produces a quarter of Ukraine's energy. Warning, equipment of the Russian Federation is firing on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. There is a real threat of a nuclear danger at the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe. Ukrainian firefighters later put out the fire. Ukraine says three of their troops were killed and two were wounded in the fight. The nuclear plant has six reactors and one of them was operating at about 60 percent capacity. There are no casualties and victims among the unarmed civilian population. At the nuclear power plant, the fourth power unit is in operation. It works without hindrance. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky condemns the attack, calling it a terror on an unprecedented level. He says this could turn out to be as dangerous as six Chernobyls and calls on Europe to act. If there is an explosion, that's the end for everyone, the end for Europe. Only urgent action by Europe can stop the Russian troops. Do not allow the death of Europe from a catastrophe at a nuclear power station. NATO also condemns the attack, calling it reckless actions. The UN's International Atomic Energy Agency says Ukrainian staff are still running the operations, although Russian troops have taken over the plant. All the safety systems of the six reactors at the plant were not affected at all, and that there has been no release of radioactive material. No release of radioactive material. Russia denies that it's responsible for hitting the nuclear plant. The country's ambassador to the UN says Russian troops have been in control of the nuclear plant and the city in which it's located since Monday, February 28th. As a result of negotiations with the management of the power plant, an agreement was reached to place it under the guard of the Russian military. The goal is to prevent the Ukrainian nationalist or other terrorist forces from taking advantage of the current situation to organize a nuclear provocation. Meanwhile, in northern Ukraine, authorities say at least 47 civilians were killed when Russia shelled a residential area in a major city called Chernihiv. And NATO on Friday denied Ukraine's request to make the country a no-fly zone. NATO says it would lead to a wider war in Europe. Russia and Ukraine are trying to set up the third round of talks on either Saturday or Sunday. Since Russia seized the nuclear power plant in Ukraine, the United States has been closely monitoring for nuclear contamination. But are U.S. forces ready to deter a nuclear attack? NTD's Arlene Richards has more. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Linda Thomas-Greenfield on Friday called Russia's overnight attack of a nuclear power plant in Ukraine reckless and a dire threat to all of Europe. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Putin has already threatened a nuclear weapons attack. 
but President Biden is limiting his focus to radiation contamination rather than a possible nuclear war. The, the chances of nuclear use are not super high, but the worry is that they're not zero either. And it will be the task of the, the Biden administration to ensure that the U.S. can uh, communicate our resolve and have our nuclear forces um, ready it, to deter attack and respond if we need to. In a recent Strategic Forces hearing, military commanders testified that the U.S. may not have the best systems to detect an incoming threat from Russian nuclear-armed missiles and prepare a defense. So Russia has been uh, modernizing its nuclear forces. Um, I think Putin said their, uh, their, their nuclear force modernization is about 90 percent complete. Um, meanwhile, the, a lot of Americans don't know that the United States is relying on nuclear forces that were the, designed and built uh, during the Cold War. According to political analyst Patty Jane Geller, some of the U.S. long-range missiles were designed in 1960 and should have been retired more than 40 years ago. Meanwhile, Russia has taken a different approach to nuclear weapons. Russia also has a number of what we call uh, non-strategic or tactical nuclear weapons. Um, these are, are short in range, low yield weapons that could be used um, on the battlefield. They would be uh, launched at Ukraine, launched at a NATO ally. Um, Russia has about over 2,000 of these weapons and uh, incorporates into its doctrine uh, these weapons, saying that Russia reserves the right to use them in a conventional conflict. Uh, the United States has, has no such doctrine. We have very, very few uh, non-strategic tactical nuclear weapons, and uh, that's a problem. Geller says the Biden administration is working on developing its nuclear posture review to assess capabilities and nuclear strategy for the U.S. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. A series of diplomatic talks unfolded today in Brussels. This as the top U.S. diplomat warns of a war with no end in sight. NTD's Iris Tao has more. Unfortunately, tragically, horrifically, uh, this may not uh, be over soon. That's a dire warning from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. He's in Brussels today meeting with NATO, G7 and EU allies to discuss how to help Ukraine and what to do next in sanctioning Russia. And if we allow those principles to be challenged, as Putin is doing now, with impunity, that will open a Pandora's box of trouble uh, for not just us, but quite frankly for the entire world. He adds that the U.S. and Europe must continue to be tough on Russia until the war ends. And by that, he's not ruling out the possibility of a conflict if NATO is at stake. We seek no conflict, but if conflict comes to us, we're ready for it and we will defend every inch of NATO territory. Blinken was repeatedly questioned today on what else can the U.S. and the world do to effectively deter Russia. He says they want to downgrade Russia as a leading energy supplier over time. However, the uh, immediate effect would be to raise prices uh, at the pump for Americans and also to pad Russian profits with rising prices. The White House also weighed in today, citing a caveat as it considers how to cut Russian energy use. But what's really essential is that we maintain a steady supply of global energy. We don't want to disrupt. Look, the energy is a global market, and we do not want to disrupt that market. But he also says the door is still open to dialogue and diplomacy with Russia. Blinken will be in Poland tomorrow, and the White House is also considering sending Vice President Kamala Harris to Poland as well to show solidarity with NATO and Ukraine. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. And on another note, the Pentagon said today that no senior U.S. military leaders have spoken with their Russian counterparts since the start of the Russian invasion nine days ago. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman General Mark Milley have not spoken with their Russian counterparts, but both U.S. officials did so before the invasion. And Moscow cracks down on what it calls fake news on the Ukraine war. The Russian parliament passed a bill introducing sentences of up to 15 years for intentionally spreading disinformation about the military. Amid pressure, Russia's top independent radio station and a leading independent TV station went silent. And Moscow's media regulator has restricted access to several foreign news organizations' websites, including the BBC and Voice of America, as well as Facebook. This report comes from NTD's Earl Rhodes. 
Russia's parliament on Friday passed a bill imposing a jail term of up to 15 years for intentionally spreading so-called fake information about the armed forces in what Moscow casts as an information war over the invasion of Ukraine. Lawmakers also imposed fines for public calls for sanctions against Russia. The amendments have to be approved by the upper house of parliament before going to President Vladimir Putin to be signed into law. On Thursday, Russia's leading independent TV station said it was suspending operations. It comes after authorities blocked TV Rain's website and threatened its closure over its Ukraine war coverage. The station broadcast an emotional farewell on live TV. No matter how bitter and dark it is right now, and how hard some stupid, sorry, people are applauding watching this broadcast and celebrating the decision we were forced to take, we will still win. Ziadko said he and other employees have left Russia fearing for their safety. The broadcast ended with staff seen walking out of the studio. On the same day, a critical radio station went silent. Echo of Moscow had been one of the most influential and respected media outlets in the country ever since it was founded in 1990. Russia's communications watchdog said it had restricted access to the Russian language websites of the BBC, Voice of America and other foreign news organizations for spreading what it casts as false information about the conflict. Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman singled out the BBC in a press conference, saying it was being used to undermine the political stability and security in Russia. The BBC said access to accurate information was a fundamental human right and it would continue its efforts to make its news available in Russia. Russian officials have said that Russia's enemies intentionally spread false information in an attempt to sow discord among the Russian people. Earl Rhodes, NTD News. Gas at the pump hasn't been this expensive in nearly 10 years. The national average price for a regular gallon of gas climbed to $3.84 today. AAA says it's the highest since September 2012 and rising at a pace we haven't seen since Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Prices are expected to continue to soar as the war in Ukraine continues. Nine states are already paying more than $4 a gallon, and the national average is expected to get there soon, too. And as Americans experiencing skyrocketing gas prices, Republican Senator Ted Cruz today introduced a bill to, quote, restore American energy independence. Cruz says the new bill, dubbed the Energy Freedom Act, will reverse Biden's restrictions on the U.S. energy sector. This, as many lawmakers agree, the need to cease relying on Russia for energy is ever more urgent. And on the ground, Ukrainians are fleeing their homes in droves. Our reporter Anna Varava ha- ha- hears the latest on the ground. UN estimates that up to 4 million people may leave Ukraine. People are crossing the borders with neighboring countries such as Slovakia, Hungary, Moldova and Hungary. Trains to Budapest run daily from this station in Mukachevo in the Transcarpathian region. All tickets are selling out five days in advance. At the same time, men from 18 to 60 years old cannot leave the country, according to a presidential decree. A woman from Kyiv leaves for Budapest with her mother and daughter. My husband and I had our own business, which developed well. We bought a new apartment and now we're here. But it's impossible to stay here. People are constantly under a lot of pressure. There are constant bombings. When the war started, we were in Gostmel and it was five kilometers from the airport. We were at home and bombs flew over a house and exploded and we did not sleep all night. We decided to leave and we've been on the road for a very long time. A plane crashed near a house and a rocket hit the house. We've ran out of food. Ekaterina says she's afraid that she might not come back. (laughs) We don't know if we'll be back. We really want to go home to our normal life. We had a very good life. We were friends with everyone and we're very happy in Ukraine. We just want to live in peace with our families and children. We want peace. 
While the family plans to return as soon as possible, Andrei, a student from Kharkiv, wants to stay in Europe if possible and enroll in a new university. Today, his hometown, the second largest city in Ukraine, is practically destroyed. A few days ago, the municipal part of the city was destroyed. Plus, the university where I studied, where my father studied, Karazin University, founded in 1805, is now almost half destroyed, thanks to the Russian army. Arita is Russian. She is going to Budapest from Zaporozhye. She is 90 years old. She witnessed World War II when she was 10 years old. Then we had a German enemy, but now I'm scared that the enemy is Russia. Russia and Ukraine were once very close. Today, many Ukrainians are appealing to the international community to not be silent, but to act urgently. It's impossible to wait. Every day is very stressful. So many lives are lost. Their children who cannot eat normally. This is a tragedy and every family is grieving. And every day of delay is a tragedy for every family. We need to do something quickly. We really want to have some kind of support in this situation. We're on our own land and we have not invaded anywhere. We have not touched anyone. NTD News, Anna, Ukraine. And because many Ukrainians are experiencing these horrible conditions now, many want to help. NTD's Arian Pazdar visited a family business in Brooklyn that's supporting Ukrainians with donations and much more. Caring Professionals is a home care agency founded by Eastern Europeans over 25 years ago. It is currently dedicated to helping Ukrainians. Blankets, sleeping bags and much more. These things will be sent to Ukraine to help people in need. And I talked to one of the organizers who says that this right here is only a small fraction of what they already sent. Ilana was born in Kyiv but has been living in New York for years now. She says she's heartbroken because of what's going on. Does it make you feel any better now that you're helping your home country? This is just, you know, small piece that we can do from our side. But of course it's not enough. They need, Ukraine need more than that. They need money, they need ammunition. I also talked to Caring Professional CEO who agrees that Ukrainians need more help. He won't be sending ammunition, but he's trying to support refugees coming to New York to his best extent. Obviously, we can help drive a group and gather a coalition of people. We can offer employment. We can offer help with housing. We can, whatever uh, needs to be done, we can do. He's also planning to sponsor some refugees and help them get green cards. That's because a big part of his staff is from Ukraine. You know, we're dealing with our, our staff that are going through a lot of uh, worry right now and you know so we're telling them all to stay home and stuff like that but we just can't sit back and do nothing we want to do our part as well new york's governor said the state is ready to accept ukrainian refugees arian pastar ntd news new york the supreme court is reinstating the death sentence of the boston marathon bomber gokart tarnayov was given the death sentence in 2015 but a federal appeals court overturned it last year. Today, the Supreme Court reversed that decision in a 6-3 to three vote. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote the majority opinion, saying that Tsarnaev had committed heinous crimes and had received a fair trial. Justice Stephen Breyer, who voted against the reversal, asked the court to reconsider capital punishment. The Boston Marathon bombing in 2013 killed three people and injured 265. 17 of them lost limbs or required amputation. Florida is just one step away from expanding its abortion ban. If passed, unborn children 15 weeks old and up would be protected. The bill is modeled after a Mississippi law that's being challenged in the Supreme Court. NTD's Miguel Moreno reports. So the bill passes. Read the next bill. The Republican majority Senate passed a bill that would protect the lives of unborn babies, 15 weeks old and up. Right now, the state allows abortions up to 24 weeks of pregnancy. Before the vote, Democrats argued that women should have access to health care, to private medical decisions, and that women shouldn't be forced to give birth to sick children. 
The evidence is clear that stripping away these freedoms by banning abortion does nothing to reduce their occurrence. But I'll tell you what it will do. It will absolutely result in a woman seeking unsafe abortions and dying as a result. If passed, people would still be able to get an abortion in another less restrictive state. The Texas governor signed last year an even stricter bill than Florida's. The Associated Press reports that abortions there fell by 60 percent a month into the ban. These challenging discussions are often packaged in sterile euphemisms, such as access to health care and reproductive justice, shielding us from discomfort, allowing us to ignore an ugly truth. Let's call a spade a spade. We're talking about abortion, the termination of a pregnancy, the ending of a life. It's not natural, and it should be uncomfortable when we talk about it. The bill's fate now lies in the hands of Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, and he sounds supportive. Uh, these are protections for, for babies that have heartbeats, that can feel pain, um, and this is very, very late. And so I think when you're talking about late term, you know, that's, that, that's one thing. And so, um, you know, I think the protections are, are warranted, and uh, I think that uh, we'll, be able to, uh, we'll be able to sign that in short order. Florida Republicans modeled their legislation after Mississippi's abortion ban. Supreme Court justices are expected to rule on its constitutionality next summer. That decision could either validate or invalidate descendants of Mississippi's law. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds took action yesterday on what she calls protecting girls' sports. Reynolds signed a bill barring male-born athletes from competing in female sports programs at school and college. She said in a tweet, it's a fairness issue. And her office released a statement saying, quote, this is a victory for girls' sports in Iowa. No amount of talent, training, or effort can make up for the natural physical advantages males have over females. Reynolds was cast into the national spotlight earlier this week when she was asked to give the Republican rebuttal to President Biden's State of the Union address. And coming up, the People's Convoy is gaining momentum as more people join in Ohio. A mother and son, along with some of their neighbors, helped prepare food for the hundreds of people in the group. And as COVID-19 cases decline, New York City announces its next step to normalcy lifting mask and vaccine mandates. The People's Convoy stopped in Ohio last night. Temperatures were below freezing, but that didn't stop truckers and supporters from gathering and even enjoying free home-cooked meals. NTD's Jason Perry was there. The latest stop for the People's Convoy was in Lower City, Ohio. You know what? I've seen everybody being safe. Everybody we speak to has been polite, they've been kind, they've been gracious. It's just a lot of people just being true Americans. Retired Army Sergeant Major Jim Coleman says the convoy reminds him of 9-11 when everyone came together for a common cause. The mandates don't bother me. I, I, I let people do their own thing. If they want to wear a mask, they can wear a mask. If they don't, that's totally up to them. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, I don't want to force anybody to do anything. I don't believe in doing that, but a lot of evidence showing that a mask isn't really going to do you any good anyway. I mean, everybody knows that, but I think what they're, they're afraid to admit that they've been wrong. So they're trying to find an easy way to ease themselves out of it, is what I believe. And especially doing this convoy, I've lost clients too. Because they think it's like a like a, a Trump, sort of a Trump supporting thing, but it's not about that. It's just about freedom. That's all that it's about. I couldn't believe it's this big, man. Uh, it's it's gotten larger since I've been following it, and I made sure I you know got in it and make the point and show the politicians they work for us. We don't work for them. I do believe it's a, every American's inherent responsibility to defend freedom, liberty, and justice for all. We have seen nearly every one of those stripped away from us in the past couple of years, and we've had too much. The people are taking a stand. Dan Laughlin brought in two trucks to hang this American flag behind him. We're here to support all these drivers and what they believe in. I mean, we believe in the same thing. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have these trucks. Thank you. You're welcome. And free home-cooked meals were made available to everyone in the convoy. We've got homemade noodles, homemade uh, egg noodles, 
chicken noodle soup, beef noodle soup, uh, pulled pork, pulled chicken, ham slices, green beans, sloppy joes. Ellie and Nate Tullius are a mother and son duo who volunteered to help prepare free food for hundreds of people in the convoy. Nate's mother, Ellie, will stay at home while her son will continue on with the convoy. We're on our way to, to hold the government accountable for the lies that they've told us. We're not here to fight that masks should not be worn or vaccines should not be administered, but we're here to fight that it's our individual right and it's our God-given right. We don't, need to, we don't even need a Declaration of Independence to give us that right. We don't need the Constitution to give us that right. We already have that right. It is 27 degrees here in Lower City, Ohio, but that hasn't stopped many people from coming out. But now that it's getting later, lots of people are starting to go back to their trucks parked right over here. We're at the second to last stop before D.C., and the next stop will be in Maryland. And that'll be 40 miles from D.C. before they hit the Capitol Beltway. Jason Perry, NTD News, Ohio. The Big Apple is taking additional steps toward pre-pandemic normalcy. Today, Mayor Eric Adams announced that next week, New York City will lift mandates requiring masks in public schools and proof of vaccination to dine in restaurants or enter entertainment, sports and cultural venues. This is about giving people the flexibility that is needed to continue to allow not only safety, but we have to get our economy back on track. It's time to open our city and get the economy back operating. Adam said that while the pandemic isn't over, he was confident that it's now safe to send children to school unmasked. Individual businesses can still decide to keep mandates in place if they choose, but the city will no longer require them to check customers' vaccination cards. The mayor added that the mandates could be reimposed if there's a rise in CCP virus cases or hospitalizations. And today, another outbreak of a highly lethal bird flu reported in Missouri. The Department of Agriculture says the outbreak was found in a commercial flock of about 240,000 chickens being raised for meat. They confirmed the avian flu strain as H5N1. Outbreaks were confirmed in the U.S. top egg-producing state, Iowa, on Wednesday. And over the past month, highly lethal bird flu cases have also been confirmed in at least 10 commercial chickens and turkey farms in Iowa, Indiana, Kentucky and Delaware. In response to the outbreaks, U.S. poultry producers are tightening safety measures and restricting exports. Wild birds are believed to have spread the virus after dozens tested positive along the U.S. East Coast. And coming up, a former president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors exposes how corrupt contract bidding is handled in the city. He says it's common for people to have to deal with bribes and threats when seeking contracts. And California is looking at a worse than normal fire season starting in June. We'll take a look at what the parched Golden State will be facing this summer. You are not just watching a performance. You are witnessing a culture reborn. Now, you'll see what the modern world has never seen. China, before communism. Live on stage, Shenyun 2022. Coming to Lincoln Center, March 10th through the 20th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 888-90-SHOWS. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. Retailers, shopping channels, and now even banks have tried to cancel myself and MyPillow. Well, during these times, your support has meant everything to us. So my employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you by passing the savings directly on to you. We're selling the best products ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have my standard size MyPillow, regularly $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. Or you can get custom fit with my premium queen size my pillows, regularly $79.98, now just $29.98. Or my king size, regular $89.98, now just $34.98. So go to mypillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1 800 number below to receive this exclusive offer. If you do it right now, I'm going to include a free gift with your purchase. Thank you and God bless. 
Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen, if you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. When bidding for a contract, there's already the challenge of competing. And now one city public defender says government officials in San Francisco undermine the system by extorting potential contractors. Matt Gonzalez, public defender and former president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, told California Insider that some San Francisco city officials are extorting contractors for money by threatening their jobs. The, the culture at City Hall has certain rules in place that allow a bad actor like Nuru to manipulate so that he can force payments. Following a lengthy federal investigation, Mohammed Nuru in January admitted to receiving bribes from multiple contractors in exchange for securing city contracts and expediting permit approvals. He uses an extortion move to basically make them give him money Otherwise, he's going to interfere in their ability to retain the contract or to complete the contract without ending up with problems, you know, liquidated damages and things like that. Gonzalez said in a fair process of bidding, contractors are competing against one another, and the lowest bidder who is already qualified will be given the job. But there are ways to undermine the system. There's a way, there are two ways to undermine that system. One is to argue over technical points of the bid that you put in to allege that your bid should be disqualified because it's quote-unquote non-responsive. He says in other cases, even after a contractor wins a bid, city officials can legally deny the bid for no reason. Gonzalez explained that current laws allow bad actors in city government to threaten bid denials to extort money from a contractor or simply rebid a contract if the preferred bidder was not chosen. The head of the agency uh, wanted the other people to get it. And so these other people were politically connected, and so they, uh, they, they just rebid the whole job. While he was a supervisor, Gonzalez attempted to create a commission that oversees the Department of Public Works and its decision-making on contracts. His goal was to prevent corruption, like in Nuru's case, from happening. To hear the full conversation, visit California Insider on the Epic Times, Epic TV, or YouTube. Major cities in California are in a homelessness crisis. The governor has proposed that some homeless individuals with mental illnesses may be forced to receive care. One expert is skeptical of the change. NTD's David Lamb reports. Governor Gavin Newsom unveiled a plan on Thursday to combat homelessness and mental illness. He proposed court-ordered care focused on housing and medical services. The individual is unwilling or unable to commit uh, to following through on that plan. There will be the capacity uh, to move in to a different category of care and support, more traditional along the lines of what we have today uh, through our LPS and conservatorship system. Community Assistance, Recovery and Empowerment Court, also known as CARE, seeks to get homeless individuals off the streets and into housing and mental health treatment for up to 24 months. Several mayors of large California cities said they're looking forward to working with the governor on the plan. Knowing the heartbreaking fact that that person will just be returned to our streets 72 hours later, they actually can now enter a plan of care and a plan of housing. Newsom's proposal would require all counties to set up a mental health branch in civil court and provide community-based treatment to those suffering from psychotic disorders. People would be obligated to accept the care or risk criminal charges. Newsom said conservatorship might be necessary as some individuals are unable to make informed decisions on their own due to mental disorders. Zach Southall, the founder of a homeless outreach group, Charity on Wheels, 
tells NTD he understands the direction, as it's difficult to help those that are mentally ill. In, in my experience, just in dealing with mentally ill folks on the street, we've had a lot of people, um, for instance, um, that we've worked with, that we've tried to get help through uh, uh, different avenues, mental health, you know, working with them, trying to get them into a facility, getting them into a facility, and then they just leave. But he's concerned about potential abuse and personal freedom. Things are these days, you know, just if I, if I, if I don't agree with you, I could say you were crazy, you know, and now I can forcibly, <laughs> you know, put you into a, put you into a program. That sounds kind of scary. That's kind of Orwellian to me, you know, that's terrifying, you know, so I, I can see it from both sides. Southall said he recently helped a lady in her 80s get into a facility, but she's roomed with two other women. He's concerned about how long she would last in there. That's cramped space uh, when you're talking about someone who's been living on the street with, with, with freedom for a long, long time. You know, open spaces, open air. David Lamb, NTD News, California. According to a new report, California is facing an early fire season. A short rainy season and lingering drought will set the summer for above average chances of fire. The National Interagency Fire Center said California is looking at early fires this year. A significant fire potential is expected in June this year throughout parts of Northern California. The center indicated the Bay Area, Sacramento Valley, Sierra Foothills, and part of the coastal range as above normal for fires this summer. The report wrote, confidence is moderate to high for an early start to the significant large fire season. The region usually sees most of its rainfall in January and February, but this year was unusually dry, and the Federal Fire Agency's predictive services forecasted less than average rainfall from now until June. They said that if there are any hopes of rain, it will be in March. Further, brush and other fuel are expected to start drying out at lower elevations during the same time. On top of that, the U.S. drought monitor shows most of the state is still in extreme drought. Coming up, a top official from the U.S. Air Force says China remains a major challenge. The message closely follows another warning from the head of the U.S. nuclear forces. And in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv, a former musician turns to documenting the war as his family are evacuated to safety. That and more in just a minute, here on NTD News. Top officials in charge of America's air and nuclear forces are giving warnings about China, one after another. And TD's Tiffany Meyer has more. Right now, all eyes are on Ukraine and Russia, but many in Washington say America's threat hasn't actually changed. One of them, a top U.S. Air Force official, says despite current events, the country's pacing challenge is still China. Russia and other threats will not be discounted, but China, with both regional and global ambitions, the resources to pursue them, and a repressive authoritarian system of government, will be our greatest strategic national security challenge. That says Beijing is seeking to become the world's most influential power and in combining its economic and military might to spread its influence. Gandal adds that his highest personal goal as the secretary has been to instill a sense of urgency about our efforts to modernize and to ensure that we improve our operational posture relative to the pacing challenge. China, China, China. Kendall's message comes on the heels of another warning from the man overseeing America's nuclear forces, Charles Richard. Just this Tuesday, Richard says it's imperative for the U.S. to defend against Russia and China at the same time. Today, we face two nuclear-capable near peers who have the capability to unilaterally escalate a conflict to any level of violence in any domain worldwide with any instrument of national power. Richard called the unique situation historically significant and added China is rapidly upgrading its military. Their expansion and modernization in 2021 alone is breathtaking. As for Kendall, he says China's efforts to defeat Washington's power projection forces have been long in the making and started about 30 years ago. During the last 30 years, the U.S. has not stood still. 
but we have not moved fast enough. We must accelerate change or, as General Brown noted, we will in fact lose. He also points out a vulnerability. To project combat power around the globe, the U.S. Air Force has been relying on several bases in the Western Pacific and Europe. Since these air bases are at well-known fixed locations, they can become easy targets for adversaries. With precision munitions, it's possible for an adversary to send a great deal of weapons against each of these assets. China, in particular, has acquired a large number of precision conventional rockets and is working on fielding large numbers of hypersonic weapons, which are even harder to defend against. He notes the U.S. must find a way to keep those bases open if attacked and explain the Air Force is seeking a new method of operation to address the issue. It's the idea that one doesn't just operate from an individual fixed base. Satellite bases dispersed in a hub-and-spoke concept provide numerous locations and make forces less easily targetable because of their disbursement. He says the U.S. will work with allies around the globe to make the effort successful. The war in Ukraine is displacing many citizens, among them a musician and his family who fled to western Ukraine with just a couple of bags. His wife and kids made it to safety in Poland while he had to stay behind. He says his laptop and phone are his weapons as he broadcasts what's happening on the ground. More on this from NTD's Jane Werrell. Let me show the people. It felt like a movie and it still feels like a movie. Just another episode. Since the invasion in Ukraine, Andriy Vaslenko turned from being a musician to reporting on the war. You see, we have to... Here he walks through a bomb shelter. For the city of Lviv in western Ukraine, it was the first air raid alert at night. They cannot sleep. Not long ago, his wife and two children were evacuated to Germany via Krakow in Poland. We did not know when to go, but we saw a bus, a white bus on the station. We approached, asked where it goes. It says to, they said to Krakow, Poland. And they say they, only women and children, only women and children. And uh, so men from 18 to 65, are, have to stay in Ukraine to back up, if anything. I remember how they cried. They, didn't, it was, they were in denial. I could not come with them. Uh, but I saw the tears in the bus while I was outside. Uh, and we could not do anything. Not knowing where to stay in Lviv, he reached out to people who followed him for his music. He got a response straight away. He now has a small corner where he broadcasts, an unofficial source for how people in Ukraine are feeling and coping. He says his phone and laptop are his weapons. It's our, uh, basically, I don't know how to call it, office. I can, I can show you the kitty. <laughs> the plans, <laughs> our weapons, uh, the laptops, and so yeah. Uh, it's, oh, Danish flag. <laughs> I learned English myself just to speak to my friends about music. Now I'm speaking English, reporting about Ukraine. That's basically what it came down to. Maybe it's the is the destiny that all I learned now turns to help Ukraine on the informational front. He says he's spoken to Russians who understand what's happening, but he told me his uncle, who only watches Russian state television in Germany, lives in a bubble and has believed the Russian propaganda. He says he wants to record what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, both for the future and for the present. Jang Wero, NTD News. Samsung showed off two new PC laptops this week at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. And the owner of Nokia's mobile brand has announced three new additions to its affordable C-series of smartphones. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more.
Samsung's Galaxy Book 2 Pro comes with a 13.3 inch or 15.6 inch screen, 5G connectivity, and promises up to 21 hours of battery life. It's powered by 12th gen Intel Core processors and runs Windows 11. And it's also been upgraded for video calls, including a 1080p FHD webcam, wider field of view angles, and AI noise canceling several different laptops and the reason we are bringing them out is because we did some research and we now see that a lot of people are saying that their employers are not giving them the tech equipment to continue to do remote working as many companies are going back three days a week to the office and two days you can remote work and so we want to empower people to work from home HMD Global, the owner of Nokia's mobile brand, announced three new additions to its C-series of affordable smartphones the C21 Pro comes with a 6.5-inch HD Plus display, 8-megapixel camera, and a promise of all-day battery life. We started the C range two years ago with our very first model. Now we have five devices. This year at MWC, we've renewed three of these devices. Very important. And another very interesting trend in that segment is that consumers also get financing offers to again, help them with the affordability. The four-day Mobile World Congress ended Thursday. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. If you're looking to get Disney Plus but hoping to save some cash, an ad-supported tier is in the works. It'll be one of the subscription options later this year, but an exact date or what the price and package will look like are yet to be announced. Disney said it sees the ad tier as a building block and the company's goal of reaching at least 230 million long-term subscribers over the next two years. Disney Plus had about 130 million as of January. And coming up, one of the world's most renowned rock climbers, his latest free solo ascents, now available to experience in virtual reality. And a musher could make history this weekend when the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race begins in Alaska. The competitor is tied for the record for most wins. Stay tuned for more here on NTD News. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep, or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility, and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money, physical gold and silver. Because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384. Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new precious metals IRA. Call now. The wait is over. Chicago's Adler Planetarium finally reopens today after being closed for almost two years due to the pandemic. Visitors can once again explore the mysteries of the universe. Illinois and Chicago lifted mask and vaccine mandates on Monday. Today, Chicago's Adler Planetarium reopens two years after the pandemic began. The exhibits here offer different aspects of astronomy and space to both adults and children. One of the visitors' favorites is the moon exhibit, where the Gemini 12 spacecraft is on display. So the Gemini missions were a series of missions where humans rode in spacecraft just like this in Earth orbit to test the technology that was going to be required to get to the moon. This particular spacecraft was flown by Buzz Aldrin and Jim Lovell in 1966. Another popular attraction, the objects donated by Jim Lovell, the commander of Apollo 13. So all of these objects flew in the Apollo 13 spacecraft, which was an attempt to land on the moon. They did not make it because of an accident on board the spacecraft. So they all worked very creatively and heroically to, to get back alive. The planetarium is a popular family trip. First time visitors are taking the tour to supplement their children's education. 
It's really fun. I wasn't sure what to expect, and um, my daughter was learning about the stars and planets, um, so we decided to come, and we've been waiting for it to open. She's been anxiously waiting. Robert Hogner grew up in Chicago and has visited many times. My favorite exhibit is definitely the capsule upstairs, I believe. Imagine sitting inside that capsule, floating up in space, and then coming back down to Earth and surviving. It's an amazing feat. I like this rocket ship like the most. It's like I've been here a lot and I like over, over everything, this is my favorite. A few exhibits were installed right before and during the pandemic. One of them is the Chicago Night Sky Exhibition. We're in the Chicago's Night Sky Exhibition, which is all about how people in Chicago and elsewhere have connected with the sky. Behind me is the Atwood Sphere. It is the world's oldest operating immersive sky simulator. With the mandates lifted and the new exhibits, the planetarium will bring some amazing experiences to visitors during the upcoming spring break and summer. Only one person has ever climbed the nearly 3,000-foot granite wall known as El Capitan in Yosemite without any ropes or protective equipment. His name is Alex Honnold, and he's coming out with a new documentary capturing his latest dizzying climbs in virtual reality. NTD's Dave Martin has more on the filming of these dangerous events. American climber Alex Honnold rose to national fame in the 2018 Academy Award-winning documentary Free Solo. The breathtaking film chronicled his daring climb up Al Capitan and highlighted his ability to control his fear of scaling extreme heights while sometimes hanging on by just his fingertips, and all without the safety of a rope. His latest documentary, entitled Alex Honnold, The Soloist VR, captures his most recent daring climbs across America and Europe in 3D, 360 degree virtual reality for your viewing pleasure. VR might wind up being the best way of highlighting free soloing. It's like if you want to have the free solar experience, I think watching it in VR is, is almost for sure the, the best way to do it. But just the filming of such a documentary, high up on remote cliffs, comes with its own set of challenges. Crew members have to be adept climbers as well. Even then, mistakes can happen and can sometimes be deadly. Alex, yeah. just look up. Because if anything falls down while I'm rigging, it'll, it'll kill you. Complicating matters was the rigging of an awkward VR camera on the side of a mountain cliff. The specialized camera actually has eight cameras in it and is about the size and weight of a bowling ball. And because the camera picks up all angles, the crew and cameramen have to be out of sight of the camera itself. Meanwhile, the optimal place to put it is actually as far away from the cliff as possible. It's taken us, yeah, like a good year and a half to work out this, this complicated rigging system. We're actually, it's disappointing because when you see me put it up, you're like, well, that looks really simple. But it's still scary, like the, the leverage of having so much weight hanging out so far off such a terrible system. You feel like if a moth flew into it, the whole thing would just collapse and fall off the mountain. But all that effort gives the viewer the ultimate sense of what Alex is going through while hanging a thousand feet off the ground without any rope. And it's so powerful because it's not just visually you can see him climbing like, wow, that's cool. But, you know, audio wise, you hear everything. You hear every tiny bit of the squeaking of his shoes on the rock or his deep breathing. And it really draws you into, you know, of, of Alex. The two-episode documentary is available on Oculus TV on MetaQuest VR headsets. Dave Martin, NTD News. Dallas CV could make history when the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race begins this weekend in Alaska. He tied the record for the most wins last year when he won the pandemic-shortened race. And now he's looking to break out as number one. NTD's Andrew Thomas has more. Dallas Seavey has set his sights on a sixth championship in the famed Iditarod dog sled race. The competition will hold its ceremonial start in Anchorage on Saturday, while the competitive start to the race begins a day later in Willow. Yeah, we have a shot at six. That's exciting. Um, and I'm really stoked for this race. You know, this is uh, a big one for me. It's a big one for the Iditarod. You know, there's a lot of things that could happen. It could be a record number of wins. It may not. We may see a new champion in there. This year marks the 50th race after the inaugural event was held in 1973. CV is tied with racer Rick Swenson, 
both hold five championships apiece. Swenson won his titles between 1977 and 1991. He last ran the race in 2012. These guys that could win the Iditarod were superhuman in my mind. And I honestly, I think it was a pipe dream until my dad won it. In 2004, when he won his first Iditarod, for me, it was the proof that these people that won the Iditarod were not somehow different. They were not superhuman. They were not demigod. It's go, go, go. But the single dad admits he was on the fence about running this year. And right now, he's more excited about spending time with his 11-year-old daughter. Um, you get burned out because you don't feel like you have the option to leave. But uh, I think it's time to exercise that option. You know, I'm, I'm still excited about mushing. CV's not calling it retirement, but the attitude is to take racing one year at a time. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.